see this lovely Sabbath morning. We actually feel maybe a little bit guilty. Yeah. This fall has come to College Dale in all its glory. Our weather is perfect when we know lots of other places are experiencing the opposite of that this morning. Um, I am substituting today for Dr. Tim Jennings. He is, he and his family are actually on vacation in Florida. Um, or they were, I'm guessing. And, uh, they're safe. Yeah, they're good. Yeah, I, I think they are in route north, um, along with, I don't know, five million people. Everyone else. <laughs> They said uh, it took 24 hours to get from Naples to Georgia, 24 hours. Uh, uh, five uh, miles per hour. Anyway, I, I think that he's actually going to be out next week as well. I think he's in Canada next week, and I think Linda is going to be teaching. Anyway, some of the reason for that is because, as most of you know, his new book, The Bashing Heart, is now officially released. Tuesday, September 5th, was the official release date. So it's available on Amazon.com. It's available at Barnes & Noble. I think it might be available at Baker Publishing's uh, website. Um, so we would ask, of course, we want everybody to get a copy. But also, if you have been impacted by the concepts that we teach in this class, those are all kind of compiled in this book. If you read the book and it's impacted you, we would ask that you go on one of those sites and write a, write a review to let people know what you think about it and the positive impact it's had for you that helps raise the visibility of the book on those websites. So we hope that you'll do that. Um, also, one of our classmates, regular classmates, Teresa, has asked for a special prayer for her and her son, Daniel. So we want to remember them in prayer. And lots of our country needs prayer right now, as I'm I think I thought we could spend probably the whole class in prayer and they did not cover everybody, but let's begin that, this class with prayer right now. Father, we are coming to you this morning with gratitude, with praise, but also with many petitions. Um, we're asking for a special portion of your comfort, your strength, and your blessing on our friends out west who are struggling with fires that are burning their homes and burning their property and their countryside. We're creating a special portion of your comfort, your strength, and your blessing on our friends in Texas who are still recovering from the impact of Hurricane Harvey. They're still looking at weeks and months or more of recovery and rebuilding. And then lots of us have family and friends and loved ones down south in Florida. And we are praying especially for those folks today. Father, we pray boldly today for a miracle. Uh, we ask that you would speak peace, be still, calm the storm or turn it away from land and send it right back out to sea. We pray for your hand of protection to cover the entire state and all the folks who stayed to ride out the storm, all the folks who left their homes and their belongings, sometimes even their pets and evacuated, those who are still evacuating. We pray that you would give them your peace that defies any understanding and is not dependent on their current circumstances. Father, we know we are witnessing the birthing pains, the labor pains that you promised, and we know all of nature is groaning right now under the weight of being out of harmony with your original design. But even those who don't believe in any of this end of time stuff, second coming stuff, <laughs> even they are noticing and asking what in the world is going on. So let us grasp these opportunities to point the world to you and show them your true character of love so that we may hasten your soon coming. This is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. So today we are studying Lesson 13 in our quarterly, The Gospel in Galatians. The title of this week's lesson is The Gospel and the Church. Any initial reactions when you hear read that title, The Gospel and the Church? What comes to mind? What gospel? For me, I immediately go to de synonymous. definitions. What is the gospel? What is the church? So let's uh, let's try to define those. Defining the gospel, any scriptures come to mind? Oh, thank you. Yeah, better. Yeah. Yeah. Scriptures that come to mind that help us to define the gospel. You think of any? about Romans 1, 16 and 17? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. 
That same text in the Remedy says, I am not ashamed of spreading the good news about God and his character, methods, and principles, as this is God's power, which heals everyone who believes and trusts in him. What is that saying the gospel is? Is it the truth about God's character of love, his methods, his principles, how he runs his universe, how he governs? One of the founders of our church added to that by saying, for the gospel is the power of God unto salvation when it is interwoven with practical life, when it is lived and practiced. The union of Christ-like work for the body and Christ-like work for the soul is the true interpretation of the gospel. Isn't that interesting? She's talking about the experience leg of our integrated evidence-based approach, the taste and see and actually apply these principles in your life. Eat the bread. By that definition, it wouldn't be good news until it's acted upon. Correct. You know, we often think of the gospel as being something separate and, and written down, mm -hmm. or whatever, but that is a living experiential issue is not a collection of words. Exactly. And it's, a, it's not a point that you arrive at. If it's experiential, it continues to grow, deepen, expand as our experiences expand. So as you may know, at the time that our Seventh-day Adventist denomination was founded, uh, Mrs. White encouraged the church to tightly couple the healing and the health message with the gospel message. Do you have any idea why she, why she would encourage that? It's a great metaphor. It's a great metaphor. Huge parallels between the two. Here is uh, what she said in a book called Councils on Health. These lessons are for us. There are conditions to be observed by all who would preserve health. All should learn what these conditions are. The Lord is not pleased with ignorance in regard to his laws, either natural or spiritual. Hmm. Let that breathe a little bit. What kind of law did she not mention? Did she say imposed or arbitrary? He is not pleased with us being ignorant in regards to his natural and spiritual laws. We are to be workers together with God for the restoration of health to the body as well as to the soul. And we should teach others how to preserve and to recover health. For the sick, we should use the remedies which God has provided in nature, and we should point them to him who alone can restore. It is our work to present the sick and suffering to Christ in the arms of our faith. We should teach them to believe in the great healer, we should lay hold on his promise and pray for the manifestation of his power. The very essence of the gospel is restoration. And the Savior would have us bid the sick, the hopeless, and the afflicted take hold upon his strength. The power of love was in all Christ's healing, and only by partaking of that love through faith can we be instruments for his work. If we neglect to link ourselves in divine connection with Christ, the current of life-giving energy cannot flow in rich streams from us to the people. There were places where even the Savior himself could not do many mighty works because of their unbelief. So now unbelief separates the church from her divine helper. Her hold upon eternal realities is weak. By her lack of faith, God is disappointed and robbed of his glory. So there's a little definition of the gospel, and she reaches into some of the definition of the church as well. But let's look at some more texts that uh, cover or help us define what gospel we're talking about. Romans 16.25 says, Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with my gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery hidden for long ages past. This is equating the gospel with a mystery that's hidden for long ages past. What do we think that's talking about? 
if you go back to your first definition of um, experiential gospel, then it hasn't been lived by anybody yes. for ages past. Very good. I hadn't thought of that. I'm thinking more, I mean, they're called the dark ages for a reason. Even in Christ's time, the true character and nature of God had been so distorted and so hidden for long ages past that Christ came in person to reveal and show exactly what God is like. They didn't recognize it, but it was still a mystery that had been hidden for ages. Yes, when. You know, we're often quoted the text from Matthew 24, the gospel should be preached and the end will come, whatever. You know, if that's truly an experiential event or an entity, then that's not something that can beam, be beamed over the radio. Right. It can't be shown on TV. This has to be something that your neighbor sees. So true. Which implies that there's people need to be everywhere that are demonstrating that to the world. It's not a... It's not... You know, we, we've been encouraged to give to this cause or that cause, or whatever, so we can beam it to this way or that, mm -hmm. whatever. And maybe that's a portion of how people become enlightened about it and they can experience it. But that's truly not the gospel. That's exactly right. And I mean, it's not something someone else can experience for you. You can't experience it for someone else. And it's interesting that you say that. I mean, if you look at, if we look at just in the aftermath, say, of Hurricane Harvey. There are people out there demonstrating the gospel, mm -hmm. and they may not be Christians. You know what I mean? You see people that are sacrificing, whether it's their time, their resources, even their lives, to save their family, their friends, or strangers. And we're going to see it in the aftermath of Hurricane Irma. The people are going to rise up, and the world is watching, the universe is watching, as we see characters that have obviously been transformed to be like Christ and know the gospel whether or not they've ever entered the doors of a church. So they could be loving and lovable Christians without being church. Absolutely. Absolutely. Or without even believing in God. Mm -hmm. Correct. By that. Or in particular, by that. By that. Yes. Hey, yeah, correct. Thank you. Yeah, I was thinking about, um, you, know, you mentioned the Dark Ages, you, you go back farther than that. Mm -hmm. even, even the people that we revere as um, pillars of the Old Testament, look at Elijah, you yep. know, taken to heaven in a fiery chariot, and yet he, he had misconceptions about the gospel. Okay, On Carmel, it was a display of power, and he thought that that display of power would wake Israel up. And it, 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 it woke up some of the people temporarily. It didn't affect the the monarchy. It didn't affect Ahab or Jezebel. And he got he got disappointed and hiked forty days and nights to Mount Horeb. And then God fire, wind, earthquake. God was not in the fire. God was not in the earthquake. God was not in the wind. He was in the still small voice. Even Elijah had things to learn about the nature and character of God's ways, methods, and principles. But that same patient God works with each one. Yeah. Yes. That's right. To reveal the mystery, he doesn't want it to be a mystery. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not for lack of information that it's a mystery. It's because of our darkened minds. Yes, Lynn. Um, I just want to go back for a minute to the medical missionary mm -hmm. thing. Tie in with this as a lifelong nurse, you know, I recognize that anyone who's ever been sick recognizes you are not at your best when you're sick. Correct. You're at your most vulnerable, you're at your worst situation, mm -hmm. scared. And yep. that. A nurse is right there, you know, seeing the worst of mm -hmm. you and still taking care of you no matter what. It, it, you know, even if it's um, if they get some terrible infection from you, right? Which they you know, shouldn't do, but if they do, it can happen. They're to put themselves right. right. There and I had a friend once who, who thought God should heal you and there was no real need for medical people and uh, of course being a medical person <laughs> I had a discussion with her I said you know it's, it's like spiritual life God could send angels to convert people he could heal people but why does he include us why include us right if he can do it all it's because it's good for us 
It's like, good for us to be part of spiritual healing. It's good for us to be part of physical healing. So if you get next to somebody who's vulnerable and you, the Holy Spirit can work through you, it is not only good for them, okay. their most vulnerable, fearful state, but it's good for you. It's necessary for us. Yeah. In that same context, as the people are in their most vulnerable state, I wondered so many times, how could Jesus respond lovingly with all those incredibly awful people around him? And to realize that people, when they're sick, be it spirit or heart or what, when hurting people, when people hurt, they hurt. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, that um, toxic um, hurt coming out, he was able to see past them. Yeah to the person that God created and loved. And he knows better than anyone the, the effects and the damage that sin does, that hardening of conscience and, and hearts does. So he knows that they're not operating. He knows they're so deviant from his design that they're operating exactly, that's the only way they can be. But he sees what they would be if they were healed and restored. Good point. Let's see, I've got 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 here that says, the, gods of this age, the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they cannot see the light of the gospel that displays the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. That same text from the Remedy says, Satan, the God of this pagan age, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so that they don't see or comprehend the truth about God, his methods and principles as revealed in Christ, who is God's very thoughts made audible and visible. Don't we see that today? We're still, there's a lot of blindness going on. And I mean, that's Satan's goal. He knows that God in his in his true form is irresistible. You know what I mean? So the, the only, his best way to combat that is to block our view of the true God so that we can't see what he's really like. Galatians 1.11 says, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that the gospel I preached is not of human origin. The remedy says, brothers, I want you to be perfectly clear on this. The good news that I proclaim, the message of healing and restoration the truth about the character of God as revealed by Jesus is not something fabricated or concocted by human beings. What does that do to some of our, I don't know, our doctrines, our creeds, our things that are drawn up? I think for any of us it means come back to the author. Yes. Uh, no matter what one's... Uh, religious affiliation or lack thereof, come back to the author and get to know him. Right. So, I've got one more quote that provides some amazing insight about the law and the gospel and truth that should be constantly unfolding. It's a long one. I tried to cut it down, but every paragraph was like better than the last. So, listen to this one. This is from Christ Object Lessons. Christ, in his teaching, presented old truths of which he himself was the originator, truths which he had spoken through patriarchs and prophets, but he now shed upon them a new light. How different appeared their meeting. A flood of light and spirituality was brought in by his explanation, and he promised that the Holy Spirit should enlighten the disciples. <laughs> And that the word of God should be ever unfolding to them. They would be able to present its truths in new beauty. Ever since the first promise of redemption was spoken in Eden, the life, the character, and the mediatorial work of Christ have been the study of human minds. Yet every mind through whom the Holy Spirit has worked has presented these in a light that is fresh and new. Think about that. Every mind, every mind through whom the Holy Spirit has worked has presented these truths in a light that is fresh and new. The truths of redemption are capable of constant development and expansion. Though old, they are ever new, constantly revealing to the seeker for truth a greater glory and a mightier power. In every age, there is a new development of truth, a message of God to the people of that generation, 
The old truths are all essential. New truth is not independent of the old, but an unfolding of it. It is only as the old truths are understood that we can comprehend the new, but it is the light which shines in the fresh unfolding of truth that glorifies the old. He who rejects or neglects the new does not really possess the old. For him, it loses its vital power and becomes but a lifeless form. No man can rightly present the law of God without the gospel, or the gospel without the law. The law is the gospel embodied, and the gospel is the law unfolded. Are you getting some of this? The law is the root, and the gospel is the fragrant blossom and fruit which it bears. The Old Testament shines light upon the new, and the new upon the old. Each is a revelation of the glory of God in Christ. Both present truths that will continually reveal new depths of meaning to the earnest seeker. Truth in Christ and through Christ is measureless. Have we already measured the truth in some cases? Can we build a fountain around it? Correct. The student of scripture looks, as it were, into a fountain that deepens and broadens as, the, as he gazes into its depths. Not in this life shall we comprehend the mystery of God's love in giving his son to be the propitiation for our sins. The work of our Redeemer on this earth is and ever will be a subject that will put to the stretch our highest imagination. Man may tax every mental power in the endeavor to fathom this mystery, but his mind will become faint and weary. The most diligent searcher will see before him a boundless, shoreless sea. The truth as it is in Jesus can be experienced but never explained. Its height and breadth and depth pass our knowledge. We may task our imagination to the utmost, and then we shall see only dimly the outlines of a love that is unexplainable, that is as high as heaven, but that stooped to the earth to stamp the image of God on all mankind. Amen. Amen. Wow. Well, let's go home. We'll drop the mic. I mean... Wow. What chapter was that? That is uh, Christ Object Lessons, page 129, 128, 129. Unbelievable what it says about truth ever unfolding, ever expanding. There is a new truth, a new message for every generation, and I am completely convicted that this is the truth and this is the message for this generation, Amen. what we're teaching in this class. And only because we see that it reveals the true character of God, not just because it's new. Absolutely. It's reflecting back on the old. It's an unfolding of the old that I, I wholeheartedly admit I didn't understand. Mm -hmm. I got it completely wrong. Well, we put it on the shelf for years. We'd say... I don't understand this, but someday maybe I will. Exactly. Or we take it in faith. Yeah. <laughs> or we believe, or we were taught the exact opposite. Yes. But the conflict Karen. between, it's unexplainable, it's it, uh, what's unutterable. Yes. Ineffable. Beyond comprehension. All words that we've heard in our hymns, and it is all those things. Many would say, quit on your yapping. You're never going to get it. Yeah. So blind faith. So just have faith. It's all good. On the other hand, there are people who are seeking a more tangible understanding, mm -hmm. more um, uh, applicable, and so on. And I yes. Say this might not be for all, I mean, this quest, but for those of us that were hungry for it to make sense. That, exactly. That to be able to come and reason and to be able to have that uh, opportunity and to find others who are doing the same. It's an incredible opportunity. It is. And I, I agree with you, but I still think it's there for all levels. The come and reason might mean different things for different people that are at different levels of growth and development. You know what I mean? So when he said, I have much more to tell you, but you can't bear it, the, the darkness is on all on our side. It's not because he has not provided evidence and facts and ways to reason it out. He has revealed all of the mystery. It's, it's we who have, are continually, apparently for eternity, going to be trying to figure it out. 
Yes, Linda. And, uh, John, just going to the scripture about this, John 17, <coughs> starting at verse 25. This is uh, Jesus' last prayer. You would think at the end of his life, he's kind of summing it all up. Right. Giving the last germs of truth to his disciples. And this is kind of the last thing he said in John. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you sent me. Talking about his disciples. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. I mean, we, we logically think of, you know, the Spirit of God, you know, leading and guiding. Mm -hmm. But Jesus is saying who he is and who he is. He will be inside us if we allow him. Yes. Yeah. And, and it is no longer I that live. You know, remedy and work away as long as we'll let him. That's right. Our challenge is to keep opening the door every day <laughs> and say, come on in, bring the tools, bring the food. Exactly. You know, yes. see whatever there needs to be done, and I freely open the door. I'm not afraid of you. In fact, I welcome you to take out the old, put in the new, and restore me the way I would have been without sin. And that's the huge transformation that we have to experience, one that goes from hiding, being afraid, not trusting God, to being open and trusting and inviting him in and having saying, search me and see the wicked way in me. I mean, we all know we have it. We have the wicked ways. Well, it's, it's, to me, that's good news. That's I mean, the good news. God, what is the good news? To me, it's the good news that God cared about the tiny speck called me mm -hmm. on this tiny speck in the universe called Earth Yes, enough to put himself into renovating me, you know, to the point of his death and my life. And he, it's, he has a foolproof remedy. He has a 100% success rate for people that, that open themselves and cooperate with him. Any other comments? All right, so let's call the gospel defined... Now we want to define the church. What is the church? Is it a building? Partakers of the gospel. Partakers of the gospel. I like it. The gospel we just defined. What's that? Community of believers. Mm. So we have a lot of churches in this area. We don't think it's a building. Is it a specific denomination? Maybe one that has the truth. Is it a set of doctrines or beliefs? So again, I thought it might be beneficial to check with one of the founders of our church to see what she had to say about the church. Turns out she had quite a bit to say about it. Some enlightening, significant, sobering, weighty things to say about what the church is and what its responsibility is. One quote says, The church is God's agency for the proclamation of truth. Hello. <laughs> we are the conduit. We are the agency to proclaim God's truth, empowered by him to do a special work. The church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of men. It was organized for service, and its mission is to carry the gospel, which we just defined, to the world. From the beginning, it has been God's plan that through his church shall be reflected to the world his fullness and his sufficiency. The members of the church, those whom he has called out of darkness into his marvelous light, are to show forth his glory. The church is the repository of the riches of the grace of Christ, and through the church will eventually be made manifest, even to the principalities and powers in heavenly places, the final and full display of the love of God. So what we're saying is the church is not necessarily an organized group. Not necessarily. It's just those that follow Christ. Yes. In whatever guise that they pre he presents to them. That's right. I know of some people who are so anti-Semitic mm -hmm. that they cannot believe that, that someone that was a Jew could be meaningful to them, and yet they are apparently followers of God. Yeah. How's that work? Yeah. 
The church is very precious in God's sight. He values it, not for its external advantages, but for the sincere piety which distinguishes it from the world. He estimates it according to the growth of the members in the knowledge of Christ, according to their progress in spiritual experience. How is your church measuring up? The real character of the church is measured not by the high profession she makes, not by the names enrolled upon the church book, but by what she is actually doing for the master, by the number of her persevering faithful workers. Personal interest and vigilant individual effort will accomplish more for the cause of Christ than can be wrought by sermons or creeds. I mean, by that measure, we've seen, we've seen the church in the flooded streets of Houston. Have we not? The present attitude of the church is not pleasing to God. The present attitude of the church is not pleasing to God. There has come in a self-confidence that has led them to feel no necessity for more truth and greater light. We are living at a time when Satan is at work on the right hand and on the left, before and behind us, and yet as a people we are asleep. God wills that a voice shall be heard arousing his people to action. This is from the teacher's quarterly, the teacher's notes in the quarterly, and it speaks to what Linda was talking about before. God has commissioned the church as his transforming agent upon the earth. The omnipotent savior might have bypassed humanity entirely when reaching the lost world. What could sinful, weak, vacillating humans contribute to this noble enterprise? Dispatch the sinless angelic host, mobilize the faithful creatures from other galaxies, or utilize divine remote controls. The omnipotent, omniscient creator of the universe had these and thousands of other options at his disposal. Nevertheless, he included the fellowship of redeemed individuals, the church, as his distributing agency. Care should be exercised in expressing this truth. The church has the privilege and opportunity of sharing and modeling the gospel before fallen humanity. This sacred responsibility, however, is not proprietary. Humans do not possess franchise authority, and they cannot deny access to God. The Holy Spirit is God's primary disseminator of grace within the church, assuming the role of cooperating agency. Rather than denying access to God, the church's work is to expand access to God. Amen. I think we have failed at that in some situations. What glorious opportunities. The church works hand in hand with God to evangelize and nurture fallen human beings. Miraculous transformation and reformation occur constantly within this divinely originated and ordained fellowship. Isn't that how it ought to be? Okay, let's look at Sunday's lesson. Sunday's lesson's title is called Restoring the Fallen. And this, is, this whole uh, lesson is talking specifically about some texts and, or verses in Galatians chapter 6. So who are the fallen? All of us. Me, for sure. And the quarterly asks, how should Christians respond when a fellow believer falls into sinful behavior? What do we think? As God responds to us. Interesting. Yes, Paul says we should restore that person gently. And isn't that how God responds to us? Sometimes, sometimes like the <laughs> He sneaks up on him and gets him to diagnose himself. <laughs> right. Yeah. And it usually starts out gently, even if it doesn't end up gently. There's a whisper, and then there's a stone, and then there's a brick sometimes to get our attentions. But again, that's not because of him. That's because we're of us and our lack of listening skills. So we have lots. He lets us go for a time. Correct. 
to reap, reap and reap some consequences. And, you know, some accountability for our own uh, choices and mistakes, and right? Et cetera, et cetera. And it's often, I mean, think about how much learning occurs during that process. Okay, how, how, do you learn? How much do you learn from doing something right the first time? <laughs> Not a lot. How much do you learn from making a mistake? I think the goal is always restoration. And, I mean, again, he's, he's not controlling. He's not coercive. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. Sometimes that requires us to struggle a bit and reap the consequences in order for us to be fully convinced of his way or his methods. Shouldn't, shouldn't we have the same grace then with the entity that we're kind of rolling our eyes at that we're calling the church? Yes. We should have the same grace and the same level of uh, empathy and um, the same principle to me seems at some point um, anything shy of truth will fall short in yes. our lives. And rather than saying, see, you got what you deserve, which in a way one could say they did, but they got what is the consequence of believing. Right. And so to say, is it working for you? If not, what if it looks like this? That there's another way to look at this that maybe it, they wouldn't have been open to otherwise. But I think we need I to so agree. the same way that we're looking at this entity. We have to have the same attitude of grace. I completely agree. I think for two reasons. One is because you're talking about people. The church is made up of yeah. people. And you have compassion and a desire for that person to, to know the truth about God and how liberating and freeing and healing it is. Plus, you see, again, the, the massive role that the church has and the, the blessing that they can be and the damage that they can do in that role. And that's if, why we hold their feet to the fire. That's right. Harsher with them because of the influence that they have. That's right. In their position. So maybe they need our thoughts and prayers more. Absolutely. In the... Um, the person on the streets in, uh, at Harvey Re yeah. Re Re yeah. Re who doesn't accept God as he understands him. I think that's well said. Well said. Or at least as much as. Mm -hmm. As much as. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, that's my question. When you look at restoring the person gently when, when someone is, is caught or highlighted, and we have a lot of churches represented here. My question was, how do you think your churches do with this responsibility? How would you grade them? Yes. Restoration is, I try to look at that person as what if that was me. Yes. Or at one point in time, that was me. So I need to take the experience of it at one point in time being me and take it to them where it led me and where it got me or just knowledge of that wrong as to yeah. take it to them as where it's going to lead up. I think that goes a long way. Like you said, it was either one of us or by the grace of God, there, there goes me in almost every situation. Yeah. And my other question is, should this response of restoring them gently, this is specifically pointed at believers in the church. Should our response be any different to non-believers? Yes, Wendell. In this discussion is flowing, we've kind of implied that there are times when we have not understood the truth. And this is a time thing, mm -hmm. okay? It's a journey. The, the <laughs> members of the administration of the entity or the structure or whatever are just in the same boat. And so just because Absolutely. they made a mistake or do not hold beliefs that are maybe the best yeah. does not mean that at a different time in the future, those same individuals cannot come to a different understanding. Exactly. And that we cannot really give up on our ministry of Correct. what we hold to be true, you know, wherever God has led us. And it does not mean that God cannot do his saving, healing work through a flawed church. We better hope he can. You know what I mean? He's, he's bigger than that. Again, he includes us in this process because it changes us, because it's good for us. But he's, his Holy Spirit is more than capable of making up for, for anywhere we lack. They will know that you are you're disciple, my disciples by your, love, by your love, not by your correct 28 or by your correct administrative practices. Exactly. Or by your 
anything to do with your denomination or if you even have a denomination. Yes. We, we talk, the, the teacher's quarterly talking about you know, sending an army of angels or unfallen beings. What, what do they have to, to, to share with humanity about a, a transformed character? Yeah. I mean, really. They long to, to that, see into. The they, 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 yeah, exactly. They, that's that's a, a, a pool that they, they, they stare deeply into, and they, they want to learn more about what it means to have a, a transformed character. And this, just like so many things in God's creation, is how one can, can synergistically help another. Yeah. How they have a perspective of being at the, the throne side with God face to face. How we have the experience. And in, in, in that working together in His loving heart, it can become such a, such a more uh, deeply understood yeah. process as we each seek deeper truth. Mm -hmm. Brian, you had a comment. Christ gave us such a good example. When, he's, when He was here, His disciples were clueless, absolutely clueless. Right up to the Garden of Gethsemane, Spending every day with him. The Last Supper, Garden of Gethsemane. And he looked at them at the Last Supper and said, all of you here are clean except for one. And they still didn't, they didn't really understand nope. anything about his mission, but he said they were clean because their hearts were clean. And when I think about Christ hanging the future of the Christian church on these guys that couldn't even stay awake, <laughs> he was on his last leg, uh, it's not about us. Nope. Thank goodness. We are, we are privileged to engage in this process. Truth will prevail. God yes. will come back. And he says, come get a piece of this. Amen. I want to change you. Would you see it and feel it and be it? Well said. Thank goodness it's not about us. It's be a disaster. So the terminology Paul uses in Galatians 6 refers to a mistake, a stumble, a misstep not a deliberate or defiant sin, and therefore the proper response in such circumstance should not be punishment, condemnation, or disfellowship, but restoration. That's from the quarterly. Is there a time when that is not the proper response? Whenever a person rejects wholeheartedly all your endeavors, okay? There is a time when you have to stop. Mm -hmm. There, to a person who is dealing with um, addictions or whatever, there is a time when you cannot be supportive and it be beneficial. It's not the loving thing to do. Right. At that point. Yes, um, I had the uh, interesting experience one time of actually going through a time at a church where they were working with an individual who was teaching um, more of the shepherd's rod type stuff, mm -hmm. um, which is really scary when you get into some of it. Um, and, you know, the pastor worked with them individually, he worked with them with, you know, extra people, and he worked with them with the whole church. And it was really interesting to see when they actually had the church meeting for this individual who was just refusing to even consider anything different um, and had become very um, hard and bitter mm -hmm. um, and yet the response of the church was we love you we don't want to do this right we, we hate that that we're in this position but we love you and um, to see that kind of love expressed in the body of the church yes was was very healing actually to a number of people not him yeah yet, but his wife came back interesting um which was you know because she suddenly saw that this was not something that that the church wanted to do that they were reaching out and and saying we hate to do this to you and then on the other side of that if you have to push them out then the Bible says that we are to treat them as unbelievers. Well, what does that mean? With grace and, yes. and love and trying to draw Trying and inviting them back in. <laughs> That's a really important, thank you for that example, because it, it's an important highlight that it's not, and this is so true always, it's not so much about the action or the behavior, it's all about the heart motive. Because I can tell you, you can keep someone in the church and not disfellowship them and absolutely shred them 
as members, their reputations, their character, you know what I mean? Where it would have been maybe a much more loving thing to push them out. We, so thank you for that. We sometimes condemn shunning, which is part of a other organization yes. structure, but we shun them within the church. Right in the pew. Yeah. Well, that's a good point. So the quarterly points out that this Greek word Paul uses as restore, kata, I can't see it. Katartizo is the Greek word. It means to mend or to put in order. In the New Testament, it's used to refer to mending fish nets. And it's used as a medical term in Greek literature to describe the process of setting a broken bone. In the same way that we should not abandon a fellow believer who fell and broke a leg, as members of the body of Christ, we should gently care for our brothers and sisters in Christ who may stumble and fall as we walk together on the path to God's kingdom. That's out of the quarterly. Here's some more from the teacher's notes. And it's so well said, I got to say it kind of surprised me in the best way. The church's constant objective is restoration, not condemnation. Many understand the terminology of church discipline punitively. Well-intentioned members, zealous to protect the church's reputation, declare that the erring must be separated in order to avoid contamination. This is a very dangerous approach. The religious leadership of Christ's time was anxious about condemning the adulterous woman in John 8. But were they themselves sinless? Had they no need for forgiveness? Was there no divine condemnation for their hypocrisy? Perhaps the notion of protecting the church's reputation needs re-examination. Compare the work of a hospital. Hospitals exist for the purpose of physical healing and restoration. Does every patient leave the hospital alive? Obviously not. Does the presence of occasional casualties nullify the hospital's mission and purpose? Would your community declare that the local hospital should close because it lost a patient? Should hospitals limit their services to those with common colds and other easily curable diseases in order to enhance their track records and bolster their reputations, turning away trauma patients, cancer victims, and other difficult cases? Rather than dismissing difficult cases, physicians aggressively tackle them, researching new methodologies and techniques to affect healing. Disease is meticulously studied, New therapies are developed, and yesterday's death sentence diseases become today's miraculous breakthroughs. Hello. Perhaps those who work with spiritual illness should adopt a similar attitude. Thus, discipline would become redemptive rather than punitive, and the church's reputation would rest upon the compassionate and aggressively creative way that believers fight the sin disease. Christians should forcefully battle sin, not sinners. Obviously, some will be lost, but should churches start limiting their ministry to good citizen types in order to bolster their success rate? Their action would prove that they had forgotten their purpose. Discipline, in Paul's usage, refers to training in righteousness. It is a series of actions or behaviors whose objective is forming a more intimate relationship with God. Far from being punitive, Paul's discipline is restorative and positive. Like fine-tuned triage units, churches become centers for cooperation and accountability in achieving a common goal, the healing of sin-scarred hearts through the life-giving love of God. That's the teacher's quarterly? Wow. Yeah. Praise heaven. Yeah, but he's also teaching at the Good Word out of Walla Walla. This teacher is a yeah. very sympathetic, very understanding of uh, healing substitution. Mm -hmm. It's evident, and I think I've said, I've, I've taught a couple times out of this quarterly, and sometimes you can almost hear the battle in sentences or in paragraphs going back and forth. Maybe it's between him and his editor, um, yes, who are fighting the, the penal substitution versus the healing model. But anyway, that, this, yeah, that blew me away. Blew me away. Yes, Linda. Um, I wish I could remember where it was, but Ellen White said, before we criticize someone else, we should love them enough to give our lives for them. And they have to know that we feel that way. And only then are we in a position, yes, to, to point out wrong or try to, to turn them. Absolutely true. And what person's not going to listen to that? Of course they are. 
Yeah. It takes away the casual criticism. And the defensiveness, yeah. <clears throat> Other comments? OK. It's easier almost to do that for people who have um, been flagrantly outside of the boundaries, say, of the church structure. Um, uh, if, if, uh, to give them grace or to show them that angst. It's a lot harder when someone disagrees with you. Like if we have a point or two of contention, it's a lot mm -hmm. easier to be uh, harsh and sharp and cutting, yes. fighting and gotcha. So it's uh, all the way around. Now, would that turn us all into Nambi Pambi, uh, come sing Kumbaya sort of people? <laughs> I mean, I don't know how that looks. I certainly don't embody it. But boy, I certainly like to remind myself, would I be willing to lay down my life for this person um, before I say a harsh word? And she also says, this is a quote you use, that we should, be, we should have compassion for people that we see that are lost as, as a lamb or an animal led to the slaughter. You know what I mean? Or they're, they're heading over a cliff. You know what I mean? So that sort of compassion manifests itself. It's, it's visible in your heart, in your voice, in your tone, and it, it can be read by the other person. Laura, that's yes. actually from the Bible. Oh, okay. From Proverbs 24, starting with verse 11. I knew you would know it. <laughs> <laughs> Rescue those being led away to death. Hold back those staggering for, towards slaughter. That's it. But you say, but we knew nothing about this. This is a, like I usually don't add this. But, uh -huh. but you say, we knew nothing about this. Does not he who weighs the heart perceive it? Does not he who guards your life know it? Will he not repay each person according to what he has done? Wow. Yeah, you. Um, I know that uh, as I've had conversations with friends and, and family, um, church members and such, it is always helpful when we reach a point where we realize we don't agree. As long as they are my friend or my family or whatever, it's fine. I can agree to disagree. Exactly. And I've done that many, many times. But it also helps when I realize I've been on both sides of the fence mm -hmm. here. Yes. You know, yeah. I've been I can totally relate. You know, on the other side. So I know that even there, with a, a warped perception of God, I still was following him as much as, as I knew. knew. I still had a relationship with him. So I cannot judge someone else and yep. say, you're, you're going to die. Because <laughs> had, had I been hit by a bus or something, you know, when I was in that mindset, right. I still was following God as much as I knew at the time. Yeah, that's now, why. Granted, I have a better relationship with him now. A lot of the fear has been mm -hmm. removed, you know. But I still have a relationship. So you, you see what I'm Absolutely. saying? Absolutely. I can have much more compassion. For sure. Because I know I've been there, and the relationship is still genuine. Exactly. Keep <laughs> that relationship with those people, because as we know, to the degree that we don't understand what it's all about, our, our construct will fail, whether it's with grief in our lives, personal struggles, family struggles. And that we'll need each other and our different perspectives to flesh out how can this possibly make sense? Mm -hmm. Victims of a storm, if, we're, if we lose everything in the stock market or something, yeah. um, we'll need each other to help flesh out our misunderstanding. <clears throat> yes. I'm following what was just said. Is, at, speaking for myself, to, to go and correct somebody, I got to make sure I'm right first. Is that I can't tell you how to clean up your house when mine is filthy. Sure. Good luck and, with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, it's almost, I mean, we, we got to go in the right spirit, but we got to be, we got to be right first. Yeah. I like these human chain rescue things that I've been seeing on Facebook and stuff in the news mm -hmm. where one person's just helpless, literally going to die, but one person alone can't help them. That's it right. It's a team. And so they grab hands. They're not all perfect, but they're just grabbing each other's yep. hands and struggling Stretching to out a chain. one person, you know, with, who one person alone couldn't save. Yeah. And so I think that's where church comes in, is we are a team. And we grab each other's hands, and where one's weak, the other one's stronger. And mm -hmm. when one falls, the other one can lift them up, you know, and it's sort of a almost a military thing. You know, yeah. don't leave anybody behind us. Let's uh, all go in as a group and let's tackle this and, mm -hmm. and uh, we can accomplish more as a unit than we can all by ourselves. <coughs>
it's a literal view of being the hands and feet of Christ. Yes. And so right. often it's only as those imperfect individuals take the step of, of grabbing a hand, yeah, that they find the strength that God is giving them to to be that vessel. Yeah. Well said. Okay. So we're gonna get to Monday's lesson in the last four minutes. Beware of temptation. Well, let me think about what else do I want to cover? Make sure I cover. There's some good stuff here. Let's see. So this part in Galatians 5.26, Paul's warning against the feeling of better than or being conceited as you're helping others who may have fallen. And the quarterly describes this sense of spiritual pride as one of the greatest dangers to the Christian walk. Why? The lesson says it's dangerous because this spiritual pride makes us think we are somehow immune from committing certain types of sin. Behaviors. Is that what makes it so dangerous? It's, 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 not, all, it's, it's not about behavior. It's not about behavior. It's not I, about sins. Correct. It's about sin. Yes. Is it dangerous or damaging if a person has a ter terminal disease but doesn't know it? Or is too proud or too scared to go to the doctor? Why is that dangerous? He can still die. Because he's not going to seek help. He's not going to partake of the remedy and be healed. He's going to die. Yes, Brian. One of the most dangerous things is believing a lie. Yes. Or even believing that what you believe is the absolute <gasps> ultimate end all. True. Because we've all been on a continuum in our, in our development. Yep. And there's a statement I read once that said the greatest enemy to the truth is ideology. <laughs> you know, the idea that we've got this figured out, here's the, here's yep. the holy grail. And it's set. And we shut our minds to everything else. We've been talking about that. New truth and new understanding. Yep. Again kind of people that take care of them as a nurse. There's a case that yes. now are people who are sure, sure they are <laughs> they're wrong. okay, yeah. They are wrong. They don't understand how their body works at all. Right. This is not a problem and I am right. And you it's so hard to help them see yeah. the their need. Is there, mm -hmm. You know, uh, they're, they're really, it's so much nicer to have a patient that says, tell me what I need to do, I'll do anything. <laughs> they are rich and in need of nothing. Rich and in need of nothing is the attitude. It doesn't Wendell. matter how much medical knowledge you have over and above them. Correct. If you don't communicate that to them in a way that they can understand, it's worthless. Mm -hmm. So all of our lofty understandings and our reasonings and our putting the puzzle pieces together that gives us a, such satisfaction is worthless in the real world because if it doesn't help somebody else because we can't communicate that, um, it's for naught almost. It just mm -hmm. is good for me. That's why living yes. it is so important. Exactly. Because everybody can understand and see the example when you go next door to help someone yes. get their stuff away for a storm or whatever, where they might not uh, understand the seven steps of yes. moral development. <laughs> you can Wendell. argue about the existence of God to your blue in the face, and somebody can have a good argument why there is no God. Mm -hmm. But the old hymn, He Lives. How do you know He lives? He walks with me, He talks with me. He lives in my heart. Yeah. And that comes out in actions. You can't argue with that. You had another comment, Wendell? Uh, on the other side of that, um, as a medical professional, I have had to seek medical care for something that was outside of my specialty that I knew nothing about. But everyone assumed that because I was a medical professional, I knew everything about <laughs> About everything. <laughs> and so consequently, they treated me and did not give me the basic information that I needed to take care of because they assumed that I was already there. And I think in the Christian walk that is also true. We may be wonderful at some area of our Christian walk or whatever and have blind spots or whatever. Mm -hmm. And we, we need to be treated with care and respect, but also with compassion in that you, who knows, yeah. you know? Um, I know nothing about cardiology anymore. At one time I maybe did, but I have forgotten it all. Yep. And 
if you're taking care of my heart, I need to know what about my heart from someone who knows about that. And so yeah. um, I think we need to be a little cautious about assuming that just because someone is has a certain position or has a certain relationship, that they are fully developed and complete. In every area. And mature <laughs> and don't need our compassion right. and understanding and what we have to give. Yeah. Yes, Joelle. Throughout this discussion this morning, in the back of my mind the whole time has been from another place Brian and I have lived, um, a man that we went to church with um, who was very harsh, and he was harsh with everyone around him. And I personally witnessed him saying that God appointed him to point out the error in others. <laughs> A couple of years later, he was incarcerated. I don't know how many years he spent in prison, if he's still there or not, but I've thought about it many times and wondering where his thinking is now. And obviously to me, what I witnessed in him reflected his view of who God was. Sure. Right. Absolutely. And that's, that's so broad. If, if in every walk of life in domestic violence, mm -hmm. if the husband, for instance, or the wife, but sees God in a certain way, they're going to treat their family like they think God treats them. And why is that? They don't know. The it's law a worship. law. Yeah. Yeah. It's the law of worship. We cannot, we cannot not become like what we admire mm -hmm. and what we worship, which is why it's so critical and important that we have a true and right actual, actual picture of who and what we're worshiping. And it doesn't matter which side of the fence you're on. It doesn't matter. You know, we, so we all do it at times and, yeah. and learn from it, hopefully. Such a good class. We're running late. So let's close with prayer. Father, again, I think we covered the whole country before, but we still just lay every person at your feet. And, and we know that you have everyone's best interest at heart. And your goal is to save every single one of us. Um, again, we pray for our classmate, Teresa, and her son, Daniel. You know the struggle that's going on there in that family, and we just ask for an outpouring of your spirit and your blessing to work that according to your will. We, we praise you for, for blessing us with this class, for blessing this ministry. We pray, pray continued blessings on the members here, the members abroad, everybody that, that joins us online. We pray blessings on Tim. Keep his courage, his strength, his mind sharp. Um, he's got a busy couple of months coming up uh, promoting his book. We pray that you would open doors, open minds, uh, and that this book would really spark a revolution and change hearts uh, toward you. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.